Can you explain the importance of the collaboration process between writers, directors, and producers? Okay. Um, first of all, I want to add another category, which is actors, okay? Writers, directors, producers, and actors. First of all, the, um, the whole process of making a film is a collaboration process. That if a writer didn't want to collaborate, they would write a novel. If a director didn't want to collaborate, he might do something else. Yeah, in fact, he might become a painter or something like that. The storytelling through film is, by design, collaboration. The problem is there's so little collaboration that actually goes on or su such inefficient or ineffective collaboration going on. So there is collaboration. But what we, Michael and I are doing is with this uh, process beyond collaboration, that's what we're calling it, is we're addressing that collaboration process and trying to explore how people can be more effective, can be more efficient, how writers can learn how to not only work with directors, but work with actors, work with producers, and in fact those four categories, how they can learn a language, a common language that they can all speak to each other because rarely do they ever speak to each other, except usually just directors and actors and that's it. Right. Anything to add? No. <laughs> I, I agree completely with what he said. I just think it's a, the best movies come when those elements work together. For one thing, I think it's essential that those people find some common vision for the movie. I think the biggest mistakes come when the writer has a vision, the script is taken over by somebody else, and they they neither replace it with their own or understand the writer's vision and now it just becomes a patchwork of different ideas about what that story is rather than a unified idea of this is what we're trying to say with this film and collaboration is really going to enable them to do that. Why does the collaboration break down? Fear. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of fear and mistrust I think. Fear, I think too many artists, all four of those categories, fear that they don't know enough about the story, don't know about enough about what they're doing, and it'll show. So it's best not to talk to, um, for instance, a director who doesn't want to work with the writer. And you say, why not? The writer created this script that you are going to make into a film. Why wouldn't you want to talk with him? Why wouldn't you want to collaborate with him? And a lot of directors that I work with, and I've worked with them here and overseas, Europe, and it's almost a consistent thing that the director feels he has to be the authority, he has to be the leader. <clears throat> and if he starts collaborating with other people, it may be exposed that he doesn't know what he's doing to enough depth, understanding of it, so best just to stay away from that. I think directors too, and even producers a lot of times feel if we let the writer to continue to be involved once they've turned, on the turned over the script, then if we start to try new things or try new ideas, they're going to dig their heels in and not be cooperative. And so the writer gets pushed out of the picture. And this has always been the way in Hollywood since the beginning, really. And so the writer is kind of left behind and everybody else goes to it. Whereas good writers, writers that I've worked with many times, relish the idea of working with people and changing their own scripts for the better and working together to realize their vision even more strongly. But there's just so seldom that opportunity. You've got to have a director that is willing and not afraid of bringing the group together, working with writers, and everybody standing up for their vision of the story before you decide this is the way it's going to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, I think there's also a fear, and when I say fear, I don't mean just the director or just the director, writer, actor, producer. The f this is really interesting. A fear that somebody else, okay, I'm the director, my fear that somebody else, the writer, the actor, or the producer, will have a better idea a really good idea. And now what do I do with that? If I'm not confident with my own craft and what I'm doing, if I'm not secure in my vision mm -hmm. of where I want to take this movie, I can be threatened by a good idea. And I mean a really good idea. And many times the writer will have that good idea. The writer can say, well I always saw this scene being done this way. 
there's a vision. So now the, the writer has a vision of how the scene might be played or where it might be played or the location or the tone. And a, a secure director can listen to that and go, great idea. I'm going to use part of it or some of it or none of it and still feel confident and feel like his authority has not been threatened. A weak director will hear that great idea and feel threatened because he doesn't know what to do with it so basically the writer's gone. The, you know, that's why let's not let the writer in. Same thing Michael's saying because but the other thing is my feeling because of the collaboration process between these four elements, producer, director, writer and actors, there is the potential which is what I'm always going for that if we all get together and we all collaborate and we all share our ideas and our visions for this movie that we're all working to make this one thing happen, the chances are that the final product that we will create if we're all open to each other, trust each other and are uh, confident and secure, the final product will rise above what any one of us could have done alone. And we will at the end not know quite how it happened. And that's the magic of what can happen but, this, but that means giving up control. Everybody, director, writer, producers, actors, everybody has to give up control. The control is taken over by the creative process, not by another person but by a creative process and that creative process can then elevate the film. Well, collaboration sounds wonderful and in a perfect world all parties would come to the table with healthy self-esteem and a, a, a willing to collaborate but we know that in real life that doesn't usually happen. So let's say there's a writer, sensitive, maybe a loner by nature, has to deal with a director that's a little more dominant and the process is not so collaborative. What would you tell that screenwriter to keep themselves and the project still intact? Okay, you want to start? Yeah, I, one suggestion I would make because I do this all the time when I'm working with clients or when I'm in a situation where a script is being developed and all of those people are in the room together. And that is when someone confronts you with an idea or an objection to something you've written, don't defend and don't try and argue it, ask questions. Questions are a very powerful tool in any aspect of collaboration I think. But what you want to say to the director is, Oh, so when did you start feeling this way? Or how do you see this character? Or what made you say that? Or try and get underneath the suggestion or the boneheaded comment because whatever they're saying, the truth of it is they had a negative emotional reaction to something in your script. And if they did, somebody else might. So what you want to get at is what was the core cause of that and attack that and work that and then suggest something that you think might accommodate their concern but is different than what's already in the script. I don't think any good director, some bad directors perhaps, but when I've been in those situations nobody wants a writer who's going to be just a powder puff and cave at everything but they don't want them to just dig in their heels and say no it's my way or the highway. They want someone who's going to be open to anything they say, maybe not agree with the specific solution of the problem but jump in and say okay what can we do about this together. And I think questions will get to that. That's good. I like that. Um, from, from my, because I work mostly with directors and directors um, run into a lot of obstacles which can be producers or writers or, or actors. Um, and when I say the obstacles, the resistance because you're talking about when someone has resistance or is not available. Um, my first thing is uh, a little different than Michael's um, although going along the same lines in a way is realize that any resistance usually comes out of fear. There's a fear of something and just be sensitive. Don't try to attack it. Don't try to you know don't, don't be the psychologist and try to deal with but realize that that resistance if you have an actor who's resisting or, or a writer, director working in the writer and the writer says no I can't do that, I can't do that. It doesn't mean they can't do it. There's some fear going on. Fear that maybe you can't do it well. Fear that it's going to destroy the, the film or whatever and there's a, lot of, there's a lot of resistance. And then I say to directors who are working with writers if you have a point of disagreement let's say about a scene and what the scene is about or whether even if the scene belongs. If you stay on the point of disagreement this is similar to what I think as Michael saying, you have a problem. 
because somebody has to win and somebody has to lose. And you've got a real problem. You know, let's say it's a discussion whether or not we even need this particular scene. My suggestion to the directors is go back to a point of agreement, which means get away from the point of disagreement, get away from the argument about this scene or this character or this moment. Go back to something that's more general. Okay, we agree that in this part of the journey, this is what the character is going through. This is where, yes, okay. And then move from a point of agreement towards the point of disagreement to find out where it starts to fall apart. And you may find out it's not that scene that's the problem, it was something before that you're both feeling. In other words, get out of the argument and get into a point of agreement and start to move towards the problem area. So to recap, it sounds like uh, ask questions, don't defend, don't be combative. Um, try not to be too passive, but try not to be too much of a fighter in the room as well. Find that middle ground and then find something that you both agreed on in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Take yourselves back to that win-win, so mm -hmm. to speak, instead of pointing out what you don't agree with and then circle back, kind of give it a breather, it sounds like. Well, it's, it's not so much circle back because that sounds like you're going to attack. If, if there's a point in the script that I, I as a director am having a trouble with and the writer just can't see it, and I'm aware they can't see it or don't want to address it, I'll say, okay, fine, well, let's, let's, let's talk about something else. And I, I will go back in the script. I'll go back in, either in the script or in the story. It might even be if this moment between, let's say it's a husband and a wife in the script, we're having a disagreement. I say, okay, let's go back. And we'll talk about the relationship and where the relationship is going and how the relationship between these two characters is evolving. Now I'm moving slowly towards this point. Now, many times when I've done this, I've come close to this point and realize, oh, it's me. I'm the problem because I was seen in a different way. Sometimes I've done this and I've, now I'm able to see where the writer was going because we're walking through the story, either walking through the script or walking through the relationship towards the problem area rather than trying to address the problem. It's the difference of putting a Band-Aid on it, on the wound, or trying to figure out what caused the wound in the first place. And so you've got to back away from it and then come up to it again. Do you think that's a common thing for most people to be that aware, self-aware, that, that they were sort of the cog in the wheel? No. Okay. So. <laughs> no, the most common thing is people think, I'm right, you're wrong, fix it. Change it. Change your performance, change the script, change whatever. Um, depending on who you are, I mean, if it, and I'm talking about directors now because directors say this is the way I want. It's like Michael was saying before about <coughs> um, you know, a script is written and it goes on to a director and the director will dismiss the writer and then start to make the script his own story, which happens in Europe a lot. In fact, in Europe, a script is sold and the writer's gone and the director's got it and then the producer is then waiting for the, what they call the director's script the director will rewrite it and make it his script. And I go, well, what happened to the writer? And a lot of my friends in Europe are writers and they say, well, no, no, he, that's his job. He, his job is to, so that which I don't agree with it because that's not collaboration at all. That's sort of acquisition and then modification and then it becomes somebody else's story. But if we're talking about the collaboration process, then there has to be this open communication and it has to be the willingness, as Michael's saying, to listen to really consider, this is another thing, consider the other person's objection. Maybe they're right. As horrible as it feels to you, maybe they are right. Or maybe, they're, which Michael did suggest, maybe they're onto something that is right, but you can't, see, you can't see it yet. And maybe they can't see it, but they can feel it. And, there's, you know, and it, I think we all have to back away from the argument, back away from the battle of winning. Because when someone, again, when someone wins, the project loses. I think, I don't think you need to be quite so walking on eggs as you kind of described about, it's like, well, be nice and don't be combative. I don't think being combative is always a bad thing. But I think what you got to ask yourself is, am I fighting for the story and the character or am I fighting for a specific choice I made that I think must be the best and I won't consider anything else. I mean, when, when we work on scripts together, the point you always want to go back to is, who are these characters? Mm -hmm. What do they want? What is this story about? 
And if you can get agreement on that, then sometimes if you really think you're being more consistent with the story, I think you have to stand up for that. And you can be combative, but at a certain point, it'll become counterproductive if you just both lock horns and get nowhere. I, I don't think anybody wants somebody to just be sweet all the time, but be very clear on what you're fighting for. Because if it's this line of dialogue has to stay, that's being too picky or too, too silly. It's more, is this the story we said we wanted to tell? Yeah, and that, that line, this, is this the story we wanted to tell, is just pretty much what I was saying, going back to a point of agreement. We're trying to tell this story, right? In other words, you go, and if everybody says, yes, that's where we are. Now we're, now we're in a place where we're all agreeing. Okay, now let's look at what we're doing. And very possibly, the writer, the director, whoever is, who is fighting for a point of view can make a very strong case for that point of view based on this is the story we want to tell. And it's either, and then somebody's, you know, the chances are that other people are going to go, oh, now I see what you're doing. Now I get, understand why it's there or why it's that way. Yeah, I, I mean, the biggest difficulty comes when that question has never been asked. What, what's what, this it, about? I, uh, oftentimes when I'm brought in and a project is well down the road, the first thing I ask, and I keep asking it again and again is, so what's this movie about? You're, you're all caught up, everybody else that's so close to the script because they've been working on it for weeks or months or years sometime, is, well, it's got to be this, and the budget is this, so we're shooting here. And I say, what is this about? What are, what are you trying to say? What's the overall theme of this? What are we exploring here? And get everybody all the way back to that ground level idea. Because if you can get everybody considering that and get them all in the same place, it will greatly at least improve the arguments. Because then they're all arguments toward a common goal. Mm -hmm. I would agree. And, I, and also, my experience has been a lot of when I've asked that question, when I say, what is the story really about? I put in the word really to try to get them deeper. What's it really about? Because I don't want to, well, it's a story about a husband and wife. I said, I know, I read the script. What is it really about? That a lot of assumptions that are made even by writers, but directors and uh, producers is, well, you read the script, don't you know? Mm -hmm. You know, assumption is if you've read the script, you know what it's about. I go, no, I don't. But it gets down to what are you trying to say with this? What is the themes? What is it you, the director, the writers, the actors, what do you want to say? What do you want to say with this story? And if we can all agree on that, you're right. Then we have a foundation. We always have a place to go back to, say that's what we're doing. That's the house we're building. Mm -hmm. Let's not argue about the beams and the, and the nails. This is the house we're building. And if, if that question can't be answered, I think there are other questions you can ask to get to that. Like if, if nobody has really thought in that broad way or that deep way, then I would change the question to something like, how do you see this character? Usually the hero of the story. Just ta let's talk about this character and say, who are they? What are they about? And you want to get to the point where you can ask, how is this character going to change in the course of this story? What's the character's arc? What do they have to learn? How, what kind of courage do they have to show? Because if you can identify that, in my mind, you've identified what the movie's about. Mm -hmm. Because whatever you want the audience to take away from the movie at that level, that's what the hero of the story has to learn mm -hmm. in the course of the story. Whatever courage that hero, hero finds is touching on, this is what the filmmakers are saying we should all learn in order to live a more fulfilled life. So start with the character if you can't jump right to the deeper, bigger issue, what's the story about? I have I, one of my favorite questions to ask writers, directors, producers, anybody. I say, you're making this film, here's, here's the script, here's the story, you're making this film. Imagine that it's finished, which they love. And imagine that it's finished and it's perfect. It's exactly what you wanted. And they go, okay. And I said, now imagine two, three hundred people are watching it, right? And the movie's over and they're going home, or they're going to Starbucks, wherever they're going. Mm -hmm. What do you want them to be thinking about, worried about, fantasizing, talking about, discussing with each other? And most of the people look at me and go, I have no idea. I said, well, because I said, that's the power of your film. The power of your film is what happens to that audience 
the moment the movie's over and what they're taking out of the, not what they've experienced during just the two hours, but what they take out of there. And again, if we can start to identify that, then we're getting back to exactly what you're talking about, which is usually the hero's journey or the protagonist's journey. And it gets back to, this is what this story is all about. And this is the power of the story. Because I say, if you're talking about the, the writing, the cinematography, the acting, the locations, your, your film doesn't work. Yeah. And I'll be, we're also now talking beyond, or before collaboration. I mean, this better be questions that the screenwriter is asking as they're working on the script before yeah. anybody else sees it. This better be, these better be questions the producer is asking before he options it or the director is asking before they have that first meeting. Mm -hmm. They've got to start thinking in those kinds of terms and not just in, won't this be funny? Won't this be a cool scene? Won't this make money? Yeah. If only we cast so-and-so, we'll have a hit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they'd never think that way. No, no, that doesn't happen. Michael, what would you tell that beginning screenwriter who's not yet had the opportunity to work with a director and, and banter back and forth about what that director sees appropriate for the film? What would you tell that beginning screenwriter in terms of creating characters and story when they've never actually been in the trenches? Okay, well, I, I can talk to the writers, and when I coach writers, I can talk about my approach to story and the principles of story, but then it's Mark that could probably be more informed about talking about what the director's going to look for. So, for instance, when I first start working with a screenwriter on a new project, as I said, I start with a lot of questions to get a sense of how do they see the characters, what's their vision for the story, and so on. But, for example, one of the things that's key in creating the hero of the story is a couple things. One, we need to meet that character living their everyday life before the story gets underway. We've got to, we, we've got to have a setup so we can see who is this character, who has this character been for some time before the train leaves the station, before the action gets big, before they're up against the obstacles and going after the big goal. So who is that? And in that portrait, what I also want to see is how is that character stuck? How is that character limited in their living? How is their fear or wound from the past or whatever it might be keeping them from being fulfilled or fully individuated? So how are they telling themselves their life is fine, but it's just sort of tolerable? because then the writer's gonna to have to present them with a desire that's gonna take them out of that stuck place and force them to confront their fears. So I can talk about that aspect of the character and how you can create that empathy with the character and introduce them that way, but I'd be interested in hearing what you'd say. So when, as a director, you get the script, are those the things you're looking for at the beginning of the screenplay too? Or are there other elements knowing you're going to have to direct actors in the role that you're going to be eager to see in a well-written script. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what you're saying is great. Um, but I'm, I'm just thinking, as I was listening to you, Mike, I was just thinking of when I read a screenplay, um, and I've, a lot of the directors I've worked with have the same thing. We're dreading the first 10 pages. In other words, and hoping in the first 10 pages, you will capture my imagination with exactly what you're talking about. Can you, within a few minutes, introduce me to a character who I get to know in his regular life and then introduce to me a problem, whether it's the inciting incident, that I am so intrigued, I have no idea what the hell's gonna happen. In other words, can you, this is the big challenge, can you get me in 10 pages outside of my director's head? In other words, where I will stop directing. And by that I mean because many times we as directors are reading scripts and going, how do I direct this? How do I direct this? How do I direct this? The good scripts, but that, that voice has stopped. Mm -hmm. I'm now with this character and his or her situation and, and I realize I've been pulled out of that function, that mechanical function of directing and I've been pulled into the story that I, all I want to do is keep reading. I need to keep reading. So I'm looking in the first 10 or so pages to be captured by an event and a situation that now I don't, literally don't want to put the script down. And if that doesn't happen in 10, or 20 or 25 pages, then I'm getting really discouraged. 
And then my director brain is going, well, if I was directing this, how would I save it? Mm -hmm. How would I fix it? And now I'm going into what you do so brilliantly. I'm going into script consulting, script, and do you know what I mean? I'm going into yeah. script fixing, and I don't want to go there. I don't want to be in that. So it's it's a lot. A lot of it is, I as the director, when I'm reading a script, and let's assume it's a film that eventually I do make, I want to make, and I do make. I am at that moment in a very very critical point in my process. I am the first audience. Okay, I'm reading it and whatever reactions I'm having to this script now, and if, it, and if it's going well, this is what I'm going to want to replicate months or a year later when it's up on the screen. In other words, the emotional journey I've been taken on. So this emotional journey that I'm on, if it's truly an emotional journey that I've engaged with the characters, involved in the characters, worried about the characters, cheering for the characters, hating the characters, whatever it is, I'm in relationship with these characters, and I get to the end and I go, oh wow, that was a ride, and I realize I wasn't directing. Yeah. Then my job for the next year that it might take to make the film is to create a film that will do that, what just happened to me, to an audience of 100, 200, 300 people, but I'm going to do it with a film. If I don't have that experience, then I know it's a long road. I'm going to have to do a lot of work to try to create an emotional journey. I, I'm curious because this happens to me a lot, or I, I find writers making what I think is this mistake often. And it's not that the script is too slow to get going, it's almost that it's too fast that it tries to get going. Yeah. I think one of the difficulties a lot of newer writers I think in particular have or face is they hear that old maxim you got to grab the reader in the first 10 pages mm -hmm. and so they think something big and exciting and you know filled with special effects or something has to happen right away and that actually is detrimental to the story because it doesn't give us the chance to get to know the character mm -hmm. doesn't introduce them do you find that, I mean, do you have that same reaction? Do you find that sometimes it feels like the writer's sort of trying to jump the gun mm -hmm. and, and get to the good stuff, so to speak, instead of really letting us be with a character and get inside that character before things kick into gear? Yeah, and, and, yeah exactly. And I think, you know, the, the question is when you say get to the good stuff, what is the good stuff? Yeah. Some of the good stuff is a lot of action and explosions and political intrigue like that. And quite honestly, I look at that and say, that's fascinating. I have no idea what's going on. And more importantly, I don't care. Yeah. I don't care that this army is going that way or this political explosion or there's an assassination attempt against this president or something. I go, fine. You know, and I'm sure visually it'll be very interesting, but I don't care, which means I have nobody to care about. Mm -hmm. You know, and there are a lot of people there, but I don't care about. So when you say the good stuff, sometimes the good stuff is the most seemingly mundane, benign thing. I mean, American Beauty is a great example. The good stuff is a fantasy. Mm -hmm. It's a sexual fantasy that Lester Burnham has at a basketball game. And, I, and by that time, I know this character so well. And he has this little epiphany about some, that something's ignited inside him. And I'm going, I'm intrigued. You know, so, so the question is, what is the good stuff? And I think a lot of people think, well, I have to do something big and splashy. You don't. You have to do something startling, I think. Something unexpected, that, but something that is logical and rational, but un unexpected. But it can be small. Absolutely. It can be, one, yeah. it can be a comment. I mean, in um, ordinary people, actually, the inciting incident is over a serving of French toast. When the, the mother, to me, when, when she says, here's your favorite meal, he says, I don't want it. She takes it and she puts it in the garbage disposal and says, you can't save French toast. And the husband says, he'll eat it later. No, you can't save it. And I, right at that moment, I can feel the whole family cracking. And it's over French toast. And so that, to me, is a big event. If you look at it on the screen, it doesn't look big. It feels big. And that's what I'm looking for. Yeah. Because it's so illustrative of all the conflict that is going on and pushed down beneath mm -hmm. the surface, especially in that movie, yeah. because the whole MO of that mother and that family is we can't let any conflict show. Mm -hmm. and, and that's it. I, I mean, one of the key principles I talk about all the time is 
Your primary goal as a storyteller is you've got to elicit emotion, and emotion grows out of conflict. But at the beginning, when we meet the hero, a lot of times is what is the conflict from the past or what's going on on the inside with this character that has been pushed down so they can avoid any conflict. But we become aware of it because we see the banality or, or the sadness or the missing piece in that character's life. Yeah. So the conflict is there, it's just not explosive yet. Mm -hmm. The must-haves for the first 10 pages, any <laughs> have to meet the hero, have to show the hero living his or her everyday life before anything extraordinary occurs that's going to move the story forward. You can have something extraordinary if it's part of that character's everyday life, but it can't be the thing that is going to get the hero moving toward the climax yet. It's static in a certain way, it's the everyday life. And the other must have is you must create empathy with that character. We've got to connect with that character psychologically. Now to me, the key ways a writer would do that is you either get us to feel sorry for the character, make the, make the character the victim of some undeserved misfortune. So in Avatar, at the beginning, we find out that he's been crippled in the war and he's just lost his brother who was killed and that's why he's there taking his place. So all of that is designed to immediately get us to sympathize with this character and that creates this empathy or psychological connection. Another way is to create jeopardy for the character, put their life in danger if it's an action movie, put their job or their love life in danger, anything that's of importance to them because we identify with characters we worry about. And the third way is you make them a nice person, good-hearted, generous, kind, show them as well-liked by other characters. So you have to have at least one or two of those as you introduce the hero so that your audience or your reader will actually become that character psychologically. I mean, that's what you're going for. To me, movies are participatory. They aren't something we observe, they're something we step into. So in Titanic, we're the ones on the sinking ship, we're the ones falling in love with Leo DiCaprio or whatever, because you establish this empathy. Those to me are the essentials. That's yeah. good. How can we identify with someone that in real life we would never be? You know, if, if you want to say Julia Roberts and Pretty Woman, well that would never be something that I would do, but we still root for her, we still like her. Well, if you're a writer, I think you have to realize identification has nothing to do with who we are in real life. It only has to do with emotion. It only has to do with empathy because we are, there's nothing in real life that would make me like uh, Sully or whatever his name is in Avatar. I'm nothing like Indiana Jones. I'm nothing like the hero of Shrek. But that isn't what, that's not why we go to movies. We don't really go to movies to become characters that are so much like we are. We can see those people by going home. Yeah. And that's, those are the people we want to get away from. What you want to do is create that empathy using those tools so we become them on an emotional, psychological level. That's the fun of it. So we become a space traveler 200 years in the future. We become a soldier of fortune. We become an ogre, whatever. We become a woman uh, on the Titanic. So those two things are really better thought of as disconnected completely, I think. Yeah, also, also along that line, I agree totally with what Michael's saying, but that we, we connect with characters on an emotional level. And if you, you take any of the characters that you've mentioned and Michael's mentioned, and you say, okay, that person's life is nothing like mine. I am not Shrek. I am not Indiana Jones. I'm, I'm nothing. But my life is so much like him because I suffer and experience all the emotions that he goes through. I, I, I have feelings of abandonment. I have feelings of, of pride. I have feelings of discouragement. In other words, I can identify with him emotionally. Not that I want to be him or be like him, but I like to know that he is actually not that different from me. In other words, there is a similarity, but the similarity is on the emotional experiential level, not on the action level or the career level. If you take, like you mentioned, Titanic, there you have the two lovers on Titanic. Do we all understand falling in love? Yes, hopefully we all do. Do we all understand being in danger? Yes, do we do. Do we all understand 
fears of death and dying? Yes, we do. Have we ever been on the Titanic? No. Or sinking boat? No. I mean, in other words, we haven't been there. But what we can, the experiences that these a good film will allow us to have with the characters, with with this not identifying with the character except on the emotional level, and that's where we get hooked, and that that's how we we um, emp not only empathize them, we project ourselves in, into them and we play them. When you read a script, you play all the characters. Even when you watch a film, you actually project yourself inside the character to go on not the um, adventure of Indiana Jones, but the experience, the emotional experience, that ride. That's the ride you want to go on. And, that, and that's what makes us connect potentially with this film on a very, very deep level. It used to be when I, when I used to work for production companies and it seemed like every year or two I'd get this, people would come in and pitch ideas. And there was always someone who would come in and have a pitch like, this movie, the script I wrote, it's going to be huge because it's about a bowler. And then they'd say, do you know that 30 million people in this country bowl? And I, my answer was always, well, first of all, if they're bowling, they're not going to the movies, so we're not <laughs> going to get any money out of them. But that's not why people go to the movies, to see people who are doing what they already do. It has to do with just what Mark said. It's, it's not situational, it's emotional. It's, are they feeling what I have felt, at least to some extent, maybe not as big as they do, but have I experienced this before on the inside? That's what creates the connection. Michael, when the cameras were off, we just started discussing the title of Film Courage, and you were gracious sure. and complimented the name. Um, you refer to the word courage, and you talk about that in your classes and the work that you do in terms of... Yeah, I was saying I loved the name of your company or the enterprise calling a film courage because at the core of really the essential thing I talk about is fear and courage always with the character. I believe characters at the, at the core of everything when you're a storyteller. And what I'm always interested in and what I always want to encourage the writer to look for is what is the fear that is crippling in some way the character at the beginning of the story and how do they find the courage to overcome that? I talk when I lecture about the terms I use are identity and essence because to me this isn't present in all screenplays. You could have a big action script that doesn't involve a character arc but for most of the, of the stories that are layered the character is suffering from some wound. Something happened in the past before the movie began that was so painful that they believe they've dealt with it, but they've actually sort of suppressed it. They haven't blacked it out. They know it happened, but they think that doesn't bother me anymore. So in Shrek, it was his rejection. Um, or in, in uh, Titanic, it was Rose getting drummed in by her mother, the idea, if you don't have a man to take care of you, you're not going to survive. So. Those, those wounding experiences created this deep-seated fear and that stuckness that I talked about at the beginning is just them living under that fear and it's preventing them from really doing what they need to do to be, fully, to be fulfilled. Then as the writer, what you have to do is you have to give that character a goal. You have to dangle a carrot in front of your hero that is so enticing, either because it's such a big reward or it's to prevent something horrible from happening, that they are desperate to go after it. So that's the plot of your story is the journey as they go after that goal. But the inner journey is about them in pursuing that goal, realizing I'm never going to get it unless I can find this courage that I don't have because I'm too afraid of this wound from the past. Of, uh, so they start in this identity, this false self, and they have to find a way to get to their essence and who they truly are as they gradually find this courage to achieve the goal. And the rule is they can't get the goal in the end of the movie unless they found the courage. And if they do find the courage, they've got to get the, they've got to win. They've got to get the girl or find the buried treasure or stop the serial killer or whatever that goal might be. So it's that intertwining of that outer journey of the plot and the inner journey that the hero takes of transformation that really interests me when I talk about story and script. But I really want to ask Mark, because we haven't really talked about this ever before, is that I, I, this idea of fear and courage, or fear in particular, is that something you 
push hard when you're working with actors and getting performance? Is it one of the elements or, or does that just emerge from other things? Is there something else that you say, look for this about the character more than anything? Well, it, it's interesting because as I was listening to you, um, I had some thoughts which will answer your question. Because number one, you're talking about the fear and the courage of the character, in yeah. the character. Yeah. And because most of my work, and you're working with writers and, and screenplays, most of my work is working with directors and directors working with actors. Mm -hmm. So I'm working in that world, I'm working with this group called directors, this group called actors, and eventually there is the character, and eventually that character is in a story. Mm -hmm. and. So as I was listening to you, I said, yeah, because what I'm dealing with a lot, before I even get to the with your question about the character and their fear and their courage, I'm dealing with the fear and courage, or lack of courage, of the director mm -hmm. and the actor. Forget the character for a moment. Right. In other words, a director's fear of even talking to an actor. You know, the, uh, a lot of directors fear, I mean, too many directors are afraid of actors and too many actors are afraid of directors and it's, it's, it's a disease that's been going on ever since. So a lot of what I'm dealing with is uh, dealing with a director's fear of talking to act, act with an actor and his courage, not as his courage to talk to an actor, but his courage to feel that he is capable of maintaining his authority while collaborating with an actor. Mm -hmm. Do you know, to, to get sure. in other words, the courage within himself, nothing, nothing to do with <coughs> um, overpowering the actor. Then dealing with the actor, and then dealing with the actor's fear, and the, a lot of this has to do with control, which is similar to your characters. <coughs> For the actor's fear, which is the director's fear too, of giving up control. Too many artists, too many directors and too many actors want to control everything. Act, directors want to control the whole film, which is a big problem. Actors want to control their performance, which is a big problem. They should both give up that and give over to the character. Because that's all we're there for, is to create the character. We're not, I'm not there to direct, I'm there to help an actor create a character. The actor's not there to act, the actor's there to allow the character to live and breathe and then we get into, eventually we get into who is the character. But I've got to get past these other fears mm -hmm. within these artists called directors and actors before I can even get to dealing with the character in a, in a deep way. And then yes, we get, once we can get directors, I have to clarify this. I was going to say directors directing actors because my way of working with directors, is, which Michael has seen, is I have a way of working with directors which is called not directing, I mean, a way of working with actors, not directing the actor, stop directing the actor, totally stop it <coughs> and direct only the character. In fact, there's a way, uh, this technique I have is I'm shut, as you've seen, shutting down the character's brain. I can shut the, the, the actor, I'm sorry, shutting down the actor's brain. This way of talking to the character so that the actor's brain will actually shut down and the character's brain will take over so then the character can emerge and then once I'm inside, I can get inside the character very fast within less than a minute, get inside the character and then what I'm stimulating inside the character is the fears that mm. exist within the character based on the script as I understand it. And then hopefully it's also stimulating the source of possible potential courage to deal with all the elements that are in the script. Do you link those two things? I mean, if you have an actor, which I assume is m most of the time, mm -hmm. who is afraid to let go and give the performance, mm -hmm. do you use that real fear that they have to connect it with the no. character's fear? Or no. is that a no. wrong no. direction? No, no, no. If, if I use, because if I try to use that fear, then I'm stimulating that fear. I'm, I'm, what I'm doing. Good I'm, point. <laughs> no, what I'm doing is through this this whole tech, my technique of working with actors with the interrogation process, which you've seen, um, is I'm bypassing that fear by by diminishing it. I, I just bypass it by diminishing the actor. Then suddenly the fear will go away. The actor's fear, the actor's real fear, biggest fear is they'll do a bad job. The actor's biggest fear that they won't give a good performance. They won't please the director. They won't please the writer. They won't please anybody. Nothing's gonna. They won't please themselves. So what I have to do is bypass all of those fears mm -hmm. and actually take them off the table rather than dealing with them. 
but that's and then the courage that I have to stimulate within the actor, which is not that ironically not that hard to do. Um, the courage to trust me. In other words, which is giving up control. Mm -hmm. Trust me that I will, um, I as the director will take them where they need to go. I will, the director will help them create the cat. And then once they do that, then what happens is, we could show you sometime this. Um, what happens is the character emerges. And the actor usually, and the actors I've done this with are amazed because they sit, after it's done, they go, oh wow. I didn't have to do anything. I said, no, you don't, you don't have to do anything. When actors realize that when they actually portray the character, they have to do so little. In fact, most of the work a lot of actors do get in the way of the process because they try to control the process by acting, and by thinking. And I can shut down the acting and I can shut down the thinking and I can let the character think and let the character behave. You know? yeah. And I'm interested in the character's behavior, not the actor's behavior. It's not just amazing to the actor, it's amazing to watch. I think one of the reasons that we really wanted, or one of the reasons I anyway really wanted to do this event with Mark that we've been talking about, this beyond collaboration, is because even though we've known each other for decades now, I had never actually seen him teach one of his class and he, classes and he did an event at the Directors Guild and demonstrated this process he was just talking about. And it is astonishing to watch because I, who don't have any experience in the directing side of this, I'm all about story and script, I always imagined a director would say, okay, now you should walk over that way or you should hold your hand here or, or, or give it more or give it less. And it's, it's amazing because he doesn't really talk to the actor at all except in the very beginning. He just as quickly as he can starts talking to the character in, 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 inside the skin of that actor and bringing that character out by directly engaging. And then you see how that brings out a performance that is just astonishingly better than the one that preceded it just because he was able to connect that directly. It's, it's, it was just a wonderful thing to experience and I think will be a wonderful thing for the screenwriters who come to this event to get to see because it's not completely disconnected. It's the writer, even in writing and creating those characters, has to be able to get to a level that they could, theoretically or inside their head, converse with their character, know their character well enough. I mean, I've often read scripts by writers and ask them questions about, it. well, well, uh, is, did, does this character have a college degree or, or what, what scares this person or whatever it might be? And they don't know. All they've thought about is, well, I know my character has to stop this serial killer. And I think that when writers can see you do that, it's really going to click into, wow, I could actually be doing that with my writing. I could be going deeper with the character and engaging them more directly in, in my head anyway in the creative process. Getting back to the writer um, and this technique, um, the whole technique is called the Travis technique. But this part of the Travis technique is the interrogation process and, and the, it's, it's a process of interrogating the character. It's, it's a very um, highly defined process and technique. But it's something that I've shown a lot of writers how to do. And I have this, like this one workshop I did in Munich, I think. I've done it a couple of places where it's just called meet your characters before you write your script. And I've had writers come in and say, okay, I've got this story. I say, okay, you know, give me a paragraph, a paragraph, short paragraph on each character. Tell me what the story is. Okay. Give me a paragraph on each character and just a short paragraph. So I go and we'll take, you know, typical family drama. I got the husband, the wife, a couple of kids, a couple of neighbors, and this is the story. And that's the thing. I, I say, okay. Now I've read this. And I know this. There was a group of actors in the room and they haven't read any of it, right? Or I can give it to them. And then I start interrogating these actors and turn them into those characters. And within minutes, the writer is sitting there in the room with all his characters, talking to each other, engaging with each other. And we did this <clears throat> once in Munich on a full project. And then the writer would say to me, well, these, I want to see what happens if these two characters have this situation happens. I said, okay. And then I would just work with the two, act, two, two actors and put them into that scene. 
this is an unwritten scene. And the writer's going, there's my scene. Or there's the idea of a scene. And, but the idea, now this gets back to the collaboration. If writers could think <coughs> about, I'm developing this story. What would happen if in the process I met with a few writers, I mean a few actors, worked with them, allowed them to be these characters for a moment so I could sort of get a sense of them outside of my head but viscerally in front of me and then let the actors go home and I'll keep working. In other words, meet the characters. One of the greatest untapped resources we have in this business, seriously, which we very rarely use, is the creative imagination of actors. We do a terrible thing. We write a script for a year, two years, months. Director comes along, gets an idea. Producer comes along, you know, now everybody's got an idea, and then they start casting. And what we're doing in the casting is we're trying to find those actors and there are thousands of them, the right actors to fit into the little boxes that we've created which are called characters. And we find the best actor to fit in that box and then basically we ask them to play that character and that's the way it works. What would happen if you brought in some actors long before that? And this is what we'll be doing in this weekend. Bring in actors long before that and say, okay, we're still in the development process. We don't know where, we don't even know quite where this story's gonna go maybe or how it's gonna, but bring, actors in and allow them to use their creative imagination and creative abilities to totally um, inhabit these characters for a while so you can see what's going to happen. Why not? <coughs> you know, it's like building a car. <coughs> BMW does not build just a beautiful car, a fast car, and, it, and then put it on the market and sell it. It tests it over and over. Every part of that car is tested and tested and tested, you know, to see that it's going to work right. But we, we don't test anything. We, suddenly, many times, <coughs> the first time a writer, and I've heard this from some writers, hear their words come out of an actor is when we're shooting the film. And I go, that's ridiculous. Or in the theater if the writer got <coughs> jettisoned before it yeah, went into Yeah, production. yeah, yeah, if, if, if the writer's yeah. lucky enough to be there. Yeah, like many times, I, I did, <coughs> when I was working with, a, uh, with Mark Rydell, and he would ask me, I did this process with a full script, and we'd, we'd work for just one day on the script with the characters, and then I'd do a reading at the end of the day, and he'd come and see the reading, and the one writer, who was a very well-known writer, came and sat and watched this. It was in a theater. He just heard a reading of his screenplay, and he went, oh my God. He says, I've never heard my script read before like this. It's always the first reading after it's all cast. He says, but now that I've heard it, he says, I, I, now I know what it needs. And now I know where the problems are. So this, this way of working with actors earlier in the process as part of the development exploratory process is really crucial. And, and one of the things we're doing in this weekend is we're getting scenes from two different participants in the workshop that will be there and we're using those to go through this whole process. So we're not just saying, oh, look at this great performance in 12 Years a Slave or in Nebraska or whatever. We're taking this raw script or these scenes with the writer there and we're gonna be talking first about what goes in and discussing it, but then they're gonna see and the entire, all the participants are gonna see these principles applied to something that isn't finished and isn't production ready and so on to see how this can be done and see the transformation of those scenes going through this entire collaborative process beginning to end. I think that's gonna be exciting to me because I haven't had that experience before of getting to do that with one of my clients and taking it all the way to let's mold this with a director and by pulling the characters out of an actor. What if the actor is more in tune with the script than the director? Or do you not often see that? Do you see that the director is pretty honed in on the script, the beats of it, the characters? Well, it's, it's interesting. It's a, it's a great question because it's that um, imbalance of not only understanding the script but being in, in tune with the script is a big problem. Um, yeah, there are a lot of directors who believe they know the script well and we can talk about writer directors too and sometimes just because they've written it uh, they believe they know the characters very deeply profoundly. Sometimes they do, often they don't. Um, there are some actors who 
when working on a script, will become very in tune with a character very, very quickly and very, very deeply. And it, again, it depends on the actor and how the actors work. Some actors work on a very superficial level, some work on a very deep level. The, the real challenge is to take everybody to a deep level, directors and actors and the characters to the deepest level possible and not to settle for um, something that's um, more superficial or to be intimidated by the other. Actors can be intimidated by a director who seems to know so much about the character that the actor gets, gets frightened. This is part of the fear of talking about the fear, like, oh, he knows the character so well. Oh my God, you know, what am I, you know, suddenly they feel intimidated. Or very often directors who feel intimidated by actors because, um, especially really good actors. What one um, problem that some directors can have with really good actors, this problem is, is casting really good actors, seriously. Is a really good actor can give you almost anything. And then you go, now what do I do? In other words, a director going, oh, how about if we play it this way, you know, have this kind of, and the actor does it, you go, wow, that's great. And I will say to the director, fine, what do you want? And the director doesn't know. And I said, well, now you've got a problem. You have the riches of talent in front of you and you don't know where you're going. In other words, you don't know the script well enough, you don't know the scene well enough, you don't know the characters well enough, you don't know your story well enough to be directing. And this is, again, why a lot of directors shy away from the actors. And I've heard directors say, you know, if I cast it well, I'm fine. Why do I need to do all that? If I get, these are really good actors, they'll, they'll, they'll do it. And I'm working with one director now who's directing, and he's a good director, but his directing is minimal. And he tells me with every scene he's shot, it's, it's a movie that's shooting now, it's an independent film, and I've seen some of the scenes, he, every scene I say, I say, okay, how did it go? Great, they nailed it. As soon as I hear that, I know, we've got a problem. Because he's saying that for every, it's either they nailed it or they hit it out of the park, every scene. And I go, it can't be true. That can't be, and not that they're not doing a good job. I'm sure they're doing a good job. I'm sure they're doing the best job. But his um, assessment of their performance, I think, is always if it's highly emotional and intense, and they give a lot of energy to it, then it's fine. So he does. I don't think he and he wrote the script, and I don't think he knows the characters well enough. So is that why a director would be afraid of an actor? They're ex they're afraid of being exposed as a fraud, so to speak. It, yeah. it seems, I've, I've heard this for years that actors are, or excuse me, that directors are so afraid of actors. I could see the reverse. It's intimidating. They hold all this power. They have the decision to cut you out of scenes, whatever. But in the reverse, it just seems so perplexing to me. Why directors are afraid of actors? Right. I'll give you one reason I think, and, and, and quite honestly, Karen, I, sometimes I bring this up in front of directors to see what their response is. But, Really good. I've worked with a lot of really good directors, and a lot of really good directors are very knowledgeable about film, filmmaking, the technology, the cameras, the lights, the sounds, um, digital place replacement, CGI, all the equipment. We're going to shoot this with a steady cam. We're going to all you know, and it's amazing what they know, and it's amazing what they can do, and it's amazing how they can visualize the film, and all that. And I'm just I'm impressed because that's not that's not my area of strength. And then they come, these same directors will come to an actor and suddenly they're shaky. And I think I know why. If I was working with a crew and I were talking about cameras and lights and angles, that's very manageable equipment. I can understand that. I can understand framing. I can understand, I can see immediately, am I getting what I want? Am I getting what I want in production design? Because I'm dealing with something that's tangible. Working with actors, there's nothing tangible. I'm working with an emotional system, a pool of emotions inside a character, and I don't know how to manage that. I don't know what I want, really. I can't define what I want. I can't tell that person, put a different lens on it and it'll work. I can tell you that to the camera, you know. No, not a 50, we're gonna go to a 35, it'll look better. I can do that. I can't say, so every, all the other directing that I do with everybody else on the crew, it's all result. Give me this result. I want a, a different color blue. I want this to be bigger. I want this to be smaller. I want to shoot outside. What, it's, I can talk in results and everybody can give me results. I can't talk that way to an actor because it won't work. I can't say I need more vulnerability. 
because it won't work. In other words, I'm dealing with a human being and I don't have the tools and the techniques to know how to handle that. And the sad thing is, I'm working with these actors and at the center of my $30 million movie, the only thing that's gonna make it work is the actors. The rest of it won't make the movie work. Or this can bring it down. If the performances aren't good, if they're not strong, if it's not powerful, it's not telling the story I want to tell. It's, so that's the most important part of my movie and that's my weakest place. So I think the fear is because I have to talk to actors on more of a psychological level where I can talk with everybody else on a more mechanical level. So it's where they're almost afraid of their lack of um, emotional intelligence in some sense? I mean, they know technical things. How you, you mean their emotional, no, you mean the director's afraid of actors of their emotional intelligence? Or, or actually of the director's afraid of their own lack of emotional intelligence. F afraid of their lack of knowledge of what that person does and how do I talk to that person to, and this is another big problem, how do I talk to that person to get them to do what I think they should do in this scene? The way I imagine it when I read it, because I think that'll work. Do, do you understand? Right, right. And, and I mean, an intelligent director will know that the way he hears the scene, he or she hears the scene when they read it, is maybe not the best way for it to play, but how do I guide the actor through either a rehearsal process or while we're shooting, to explore a range of possible um, emotional um, moments out of which I can make a really good scene. How do I do that? I mean, it's a mystery and it's, and it's very different. So I think the, a lot of directors will just shoot a lot. Okay, let's do it again. What do you want? I just did it again. I, need, uh, I heard this on the set the other day, a long time ago. I need more, bigger emotions this time. And they asked, you know, now the actors do it, with, they did it louder. That's all they did. <laughs> Bigger emotions. I, you know, I, need, I need more vulnerability. And, and I, my heart goes out to directors because I see them fighting to find the language with which to deal with a human being which is giving them a genuine emotional um, performance. And how do you modify that? It's easier to say, okay, now that no, the, the shadows are too sharp. I, I need it darker. I mean, or we'll we'll fix that in color correction. Or, that's easy. I can't I can't adjust an actor's performance in post production. I can't do that. And so it's it's the fact that that part of directing is all psychology. It's not technical at all, and they try to make it technical. Are there specific techniques a director can? employ with an actor to get an authentic performance? Yes. Don't you love that answer? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, there, I, mean, there, the, I mean, one way the director has to think about, you know, in terms of authentic performance, um, a little bit of what that means, that what that really means is the character that you're watching portrayed by the actor. The character is actually authentically thinking, feeling, um, intending, moving as the character intends. Authent authenticity in the character means this is exactly what's going on in the character, not something that's, quote, manufactured by the actor or planned by the actor. Uh, one thing I talk about a lot and I'm very serious about this, that one of the things that's most detrimental to a good performance um, is an actor with a plan. As soon as actor says to me, oh, I know how to play this scene. I got read the scene, I know, I know how to do this. As soon as I hear that, I know I'm in trouble because it's a plan, because we never in life plan how to play a scene. We as, the, as a character, I as a character, you as a character, going into a moment, as a person going into a moment, we have an idea of what we want to do but we don't have a plan like an actor could have a plan because an actor says, I know how I'm gonna play this line, I know how I'm gonna do this move, and it all becomes mechanical. It may become a, a performance that's brilliant and stunning, but it won't feel authentic. It'll feel like a performance. So an, actually an authentic, quote, performance really is not a performance at all. An authentic moment with a character is an authentic moment with a character, and directors have to th think that way. And so consequently, directors have to stop asking actors 
to give a certain result. I need more anger, I need more rage, I need more empathy, I need more humility, I need more vulnerability because that's a plan. If the director can think about igniting the character and what the character is trying to do in the situation, then the director will get a more authentic performance. It may not be exactly the one he was hoping for or aiming at, but it will be authentic. Can you tell us a story of any time you corrected a director on directing an actor and not the character? Oh. Without naming any names. <laughs> Without naming any or names. Or projects. Or <clears throat> um, yeah, that's, that's really, I mean, there are, there are a lot of them. There are a lot of them. There are a lot of um, times I've been working with <coughs> directors. Now, you got to understand that when I'm working with the director, uh, if I'm consulting on a project, not, not in a workshop, workshop is one thing, but actually working on a project, there's a whole process that the director and I go through, which we call workshopping, which we bring actors in to actually do every single scene in the movie. These are not the actors that will be in the movie. And we're doing two or three things simultaneously. We're exploring the characters, we're exploring the staging of the scene, and I'm also working with the director on how he's working, he or she is working with the actors. And this is many times when I run into the result directing. And what I'll do is the director may say to the actor, we're doing a scene, the scene's going okay, then that director will say to the actor, okay, let's do it again. And um, she, meaning the character, is more afraid here. She, I need to see more fear. And what I'll do right at that moment, I'll stop because this is a workshop situation, workshopping, it's a consulting, and I'll stop and I'll say to the director, I'm going to do you a big favor right now. Something that will never happen unless I'm here to do it for you. I'm going to ask the actor a question. And he goes, okay. And I say to the actor, what did you just hear and what did you just feel? And the actor will say, oh, well, I heard that he wants more anger and rage. I said, how do you feel? And she goes, I'm pissed off and I'm confused. And I say to the director, that's what you're going to get. Is that what you want? He goes, uh, well, no. And then I explain, see, what the pissed off and confused is that you've bypassed her process. You've told her, just give me a result, figure out how to get there. Rather than going back and talking to the character, rather than saying she is more angry or she is more enraged at this moment, go back to the character and build within the character the reason for the rage. Build the rage and then just send her into the scene. So this is the diff big difference between directing the actor is giving a result and, and actually telling the actor uh, what you want, telling the actor the, the results you want, and even <coughs> telling the actor what you want them to do on certain lines do this on this line and the difference between that and actually talking to the character and igniting the character in a different way and then send them into the scene and chances are you'll get exactly what you want. How, how do you mean though? What, how do you do that? How would you build rage if you're talking to the character through the actor? What, what might you say? Okay, let, let's say it's a scene between boyfriend and girlfriend, uh -huh. which this one was and uh, basically, you know, it's with this scene, um, we, and we all know this because we read the scene, it's going to end up in a rape at the end of the scene, a date rape. Okay. Okay. And she um, is very angry with him because he's being very inappropriate with her and he's being overly aggressive. So, and this is where the director said he wanted more anger and he's thinking appropriately, like, I need that anger to get him angry enough to stimulate the rape. Okay? But the thing is, why is she angry? To, be, to begin with. Now I could just say to her, I need more anger out of her. Of her. Mm -hmm. But I can go back to the character, her name is Susan, I, and, I could say, and I go back to, to Susan, I said, Susan, why are you on this date now? And she'll answer the question, why am I, I said, do you really want to be with him? Now she says, I don't, and I can start to question what's going on inside the character at that moment, why she's resenting him, why she doesn't want to be on the date, why this is bringing up some kind of fears and discomfort within her, and I'm just, I'm just building that actually what's going on in the character at that moment. I'm just igniting that and I say, okay, let's do the scene again. And now she goes into the scene with all these feelings genuinely inside her, not manufactured, they're genuinely in there. And she goes in the scene and you'll get it. You'll get what you want. In other words, it's 
I know what the result is I want, what's going to cause that within the character for that to happen, I have to ignite that. I don't have to ask for the result, I have to ignite what causes the result. The cause, not the effect. Okay. So you're egging Susan on, you're saying, you're actually giving examples, saying he's, he's, he's being too rough with you, he's being disrespectful, you're, you're almost throwing out yeah. things? Yes and no, Karen. I'm not egging her on, I would never do that, because it's all, this is all done with questions, that's why it's called interrogation. I would say, how do you feel about him right now? I just feel fine. Well, why are you with him? I, I don't, do you want to be with him? No. I said, then why don't you leave? Now, I'm still asking her a question, and I'm forcing her to question herself. Do you know Rather than me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not um, attaching something to her. I'm stimulating something from within her, and I start to, and I can stimulate the emotions that come on with whatever this discomfort is or this, this, um, these feelings that she's having inside. And now what's happening is the actress, we'll just call her Joan. The actress Joan is gone. Susan is so ignited because I'm just interrogating Susan, interrogating Susan, and she's so ignited. I said, go into the scene. Joan, the actress, is, is basically, and this is what a lot of the actors say when they work this way, goes, I'm just going to watch and see what Susan does. <laughs> she, they have no control. They have no control over the character. The tar character totally takes control. So that's, that's the difference, you know, in working with actors, and this is the problem. This is what I deal with all the time. When I'm consulting, I'm dealing with it. When I'm teaching directors how to work, this is what Michael saw at the, at the DGA. You remember all that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What does the director say to an actor after he yells cut? Okay, I'll tell you what I think they should say. Uh, but it's a good question because very often, too often, they say nothing to the actor. They'll just, they'll go on to talk to the cameraman, they'll talk to sound, all that's appropriate, but somehow the actor is ignored. Or they'll say, okay, fine, fine, we're moving on. My thing is, the first thing you say to an actor after every take, after every, even after every rehearsal, is always say, thank you, very good. Acknowledge the work. My contention is that an actor is always doing the best they can with the information they have. Just acknowledge that. Even if it's not what you want, even if you don't like it, say thank you, very good. Acknowledge the effort. Because the reason for this is a director's, one of the director's primary jobs working with actors, and this is a, not a difficult one to do, but a lot of directors don't do it, is to create a really safe place. A safe place is a, an environment that has literally no criticism. Any director who criticizes an actor for performance is shooting themselves in the foot because as soon as an actor is criticized, they start to shut down inside. And you want their emotional system and their life experience to be available to you and you are going to criticize them, it's not going to happen. They will keep acting and that's what you'll get is acting. You won't get good authentic performances. To create that safe place, one of, there are many ways, but one of them is constantly acknowledge them and constantly praise them. Just say thank you. Very good. That's all it has to be. Nothing more than that. And then they will stay open and then they will stay available to you. And then there are a lot of ways, which I can get into another time, is even if you don't like what you're seeing, how you can make an adjustment. One way is the interrogation. I can say thank you, very good, start interrogating the characters and send them in again and then the performances will change and I'll get what I want. So um, there's a way to be constructive without criticizing. There's a way to, you say, interrogate yeah. without... Can you give me an example of what a criticism would be on set and how that actor would shut down? Okay, Im imagine you're, you set up a scene, you've rehearsed the scene, you did your first take. Um, let's say it was with the two of you, I'm doing the scene. We did our first take and my reaction was, oh, oh damn. Okay, now that, oh no, that's okay, we've we got to do this again. That didn't work, right? And right then, how do you feel? Horrible, right? Pretty much, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. ah, I haven't pleased the director, it's not what he wanted, um, I'm, I'm not a good enough actress, he's probably thinking, wondering why he hired me, all, all of these things. Now that, that was a criticism, not a harsh criticism. I mean, it gets a lot harsher than sure. that. Yeah, but that wasn't harsh, but that was, those things happen all the time. Or, you do the scene, I'm doing a close-up on you, and you're doing it. Okay, no, 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 that's not what I meant. I, here's what I mean. You, you got, you know, and then I start to give you more results. I even give you a line reading. And what's going to happen inside you? You are dying. Or you're angry. 
or you're resentful. In other words, I'm now I'm stimulating inside you all the emotions I don't need. I don't need any of those. You know, my job is to stimulate inside you the emotions I do need for you for the character. That's why I say direct the character. So any criticism or adjustment that sounds like it's critical or that the, when the, when the um, director is disappointed in the performance is damaging. It's always damaging. So taking that same scenario and let's suppose it wasn't to your liking, it's not what you need, how would you do it where it was more of an interrogation and it was more sort of positive reinforcement? Okay, let's say you did a take I didn't like it at all. Okay, I did a close up of you and I'm going, that's not what I want at all. I would say, thank you, thank you. Very, very, very good. Okay, we're going to go again. And then right at that moment, I'll start interrogating your character and I'll start asking your character questions. And what will happen for you, Karen, is your mind, your actor mind will go away. Your actor mind hood, thank you, very good. We're going to go again. That's what, you know, now, I'm, now the character brain is totally activated and now you're just totally in the, and you're not thinking about the last take. You're not, I, I can get the last take out of your head. I can get all of that and I've got you back into the character. I'll make, and through these questions, I can adjust your emotional state of mind within 30 seconds and, and say, okay, roll, let's go again. And now you're going again and you're going again. You're going to do the same scene. One thing you do not have in your head, which is good, is how are you going to do this scene? You have no idea. You just know that now you feel a little more um, resentful. Let's say I did that. You feel more resentful of the, your scene partner and you're going into the scene. And I say, just go in the scene. And you know what you get to do? Just do the scene the best you can. And do you know what? It'll change. It'll be different. And because there's no plan from you or me, it will be authentic. And you may even come out and you may even afterwards go, wow, that came out different. I go, yeah, it was great. Okay, let's do another one. And each one will be authentic because the authenticity, the lack of authenticity is because of the plan. You and I can't be authentic even in this moment. If we had a plan, right now we're just in a conversation. That's authentic.